You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or their affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. It's Monday evening, and you're listening to Joe and Gemma on the Supernatural Show. Hi guys, good evening, and welcome to this week's episode of the Supernatural Show. I hope everybody's had a great week. Tonight, I am joined in the studio by the lovely Mr. Nib. Good evening, Mr. Nib. Hi, Gemma. Thanks for How having me. How are you doing? Okay. Yep, not too bad, thanks. Good week? Uh, yeah, busy one so far. It's only just started, hasn't it? It's Monday. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going from last Monday, right? Oh, right, yeah, that was a busy week, yeah, no. Yeah, Always yeah. a busy week. So what's been occurring in the panel, Mr Nib? Um, for me, lots of stuff. Uh, lots of writing for the SPR, for the magazine, um, and but blogs as well. I'm writing with uh, Sarah Trimisero, still, still continue with the um, uh, supernatural synchronous um okay so line. so before you go any further on that 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 has come to an end in regards to the weekly blogs yeah and the backwards and forwards so what is happening there you just said that you're still continuing so is there going to be a second series um i don't know yet but we are working on uh, on, a, on a on a book um, off the back of it that will include the posts from both of our websites but also some new material and stuff like that from us both to put into a book format in order to get that out by the end of the year. So, well, fingers crossed by the year. So no pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> by the end of the year, there's going to be a book out. Yes, yeah, well, yes, I hope so. Yeah. Um, at the moment, <laughs> Sarah's whipping my ass on the right, and she's got thousands of words down, and I've got some ideas in my head. <laughs> I'm turning into some words soon, probably over the next week or two. So um, how does that whole process work then? You, since, since you've just said it, uh, and I asked Sarah the same question when I asked Sarah on, because I'm not a natural writer, so I find it really difficult to compose a blog of any form. Whereas you seem to flow really well. So how does the whole process go? So you get the ideas in your head. Yep. Right, so for me, it's, I mean, and I can use, actually, to be fair, I can use so good, because... Um, as far as I understand, Sarah, Sarah chucks her ideas down on paper and then she'll write it out onto the laptop straight away. Um, mm-hmm. Because I spend because I spend a lot of my working day on the computer, working on the computer, I find it very difficult to continue doing that. So what I do is I, I have um, like a, a notebook, if you like, or a journal sort of thing, and I, I'll write, I'll go straight into the idea and and write it out in handwritten form straight into the book. So I do probably. Um, if it's a, a blog, for example, about 1,500 words, maybe I'll do a few pages in that journal, knowing that'll be around about 15, 1,600 words, um, all in one hit, and I can I can sort of like drop it straight down there onto the paper, and then from that I can then take it to the computer, write it up, and then as I write it up, I can then expand on that and edit it a little bit and throw it together so it packages a bit better when it goes into a blog form. Um, so and that's where how do you I... find your information to put into it? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Literally everywhere. Sometimes you'll see something on social media feeds, and it'll spur it'll spur like an idea to write about. Sometimes it'll be um, anything in the in the in the world around you that will just give you an idea. Um, sometimes someone will say something um, like a haunted microwave, um, and then you'll literally go, "That's not a bad idea," and then you'll just kind of go with it. It can be so, a couple of mine have been sarcastic things people have said. Um, they've been weird things my kids have said, and and they just it, it's it's almost like a title or an idea and just from that you kind of go hang on a minute, i could do that with this and you kind of just it just kind of formulates and you just start writing and getting it down that's how it kind of comes out um but yours yours do come quite well in all fairness haunted the haunted microwave classic example absolutely <laughs> hilarious that was a good fun to write actually that one yeah, <laughs> well it was absolutely hilarious but the fundamental um facts were definitely there you know just because something throws off emf does not mean that it's haunted no no i think i think that's kind of what, what i was going to get with that is this um it was a play on the fact that you've got a lot of people that are into haunted objects and things like that at the moment so there's a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of running with um uh you know haunted object museums popping up on it which is fine is there? there certainly I can't is. Say as I'd um, that. no there's a couple here and there and over in the states oh. too but, 
it's a bit of a thing. Um, oh, oh and dear. I must kind of push made... upon my research. <laughs> it, made me, it made me think that there's obviously a possibility of that's obviously being a thing. And then in order to write about those kind of situations and systems like that, you need a haunted object. But you can't have a haunted object that's obvious, like, um, I don't know, an old wine box or, you know, a, 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 you know, a Victorian piano. What is that, not Victorian. a Dybbuk box? Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I figured the best one would be a plain, a plain white microwave um, that you buy, you know, from Asda or other supermarkets are available. Um, <laughs> kind of thing where you just got like, a, you know, it's just a basic white microwave that you get for like 20 quid. Basic, and it's got nothing, it, and it, it doesn't have much of a history or anything like that. And that that's where the idea, because but the, your microwave has got a, a history. It's got it, a history it was, that it I made up. It was previously owned by a serial killer, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So if it's like, and that's that's the that's the premise of it, and that's the understanding of it, it, it of all these objects. Once you start to give them a history, you begin to give them a character. And once you begin to give them a character and an understanding, that character builds into almost an apparition of itself. Mm-hmm. And by doing so, and this is the same thing that happens with haunted houses, in my opinion, as well. A, ha- a haunted house is like a big object, basically. And as that begins to get more and more history bound to it and stuff like that, it builds up its own kind of apparitional kind of history and information. And then people are going, oh, hang on, this has got this. So the same thing happens with an object as what happens with a haunted house. And that's, you know, that's my opinion on that. People will I probably agree and disagree agree on that. Um, well, how, how much of a haunted house is um, brought on by oneself? Well, the, people go in with with preconceived ideas of what's going to happen so they're already taking that energy into a building anyway well exactly so yeah so people when they go into a it's transference place, isn't it yeah, but it's like transference yeah they go into it with preconceived ideas or they've, they've looked at it or you'll get people to say i've not looked at anything at all and then you could say drop into the whole telepathy thing but that's a whole other subject um um and the, and the same thing happens with an object just okay not going inside an object but because the object is there and you know things about it or someone knows something about it, all of a sudden it becomes that same kind of situation. And then obviously we want to attribute things when things happen that are odd, we want to attribute them to something that's physical when obviously an object is a physical item that we can link mm-hmm. things to as well. So if you don't want it to be the house that's haunted or the thing that's turned up recently is this object, my microwave, um, then you can, <laughs> you, can, you can go ahead, you can go ahead and say, oh, that's all the weird stuff that's happened there then. But, it's it's a stretch, and that's it's the same with the haunted houses in most cases. It's a stretch, unfortunately, that we have to. It's be just bit... jumping to conclusions, isn't it? It can be. I mean, I'm not I'm not disregarding all the experiences and that that people have had over the years because there's a, there's a lot documented that goes back yonks and yonks. I mean, and yes, we still don't. have You a can't discount for... everything. The no, skull, no. the skull experiment, classic example of that. You know, we can't yeah. discount um, anything of of what they witnessed. No, there's loads. There's loads. I and mean, if you go all the way back to like um, the SPR again with their uh, their research, you've got the um, phantoms as a living and uh, Myers as human personality in survival. Mm-hmm. That's they've, they've all got both of those have got humongous amounts of cases b- bound into them about different things as well. And the book that I've just read as well, Apparitions by Tyrrell, that's got lots of cases all linked into it as well about people's experiences and all that kind of stuff. And that's how they're getting to understand them. Um, but they're looking at hundreds, well, not hundreds, thousands of thousands of cases of this situation in order to try and understand them and not snapshot in one night in one location and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit more wider ranging, if you like. than Uh, than... It's much more in depth, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, a lot of people may not know that you actually composed your own investigator's guidebook. Not a guidebook. It's um, (laughs) a research book. Oh, um, you mean the, the, the uh, yes, the, 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 it's like a, it's like an aid really for investigators, um, the, the paranormal investigators journal. Is that what you would call it, an aid? Yeah, because, um, for me, when I went out, when I used to go out investigating and do ghost hunts and stuff like that, um, I, I was an avid note taker, if you like, um, and I soon that noticed. surprises that, me, Mr. Nip. <laughs> I know, right? Um, and I soon noticed there was a lot of things, that, especially around things like a, a paranormal events when they happened and information that I wanted to log according to a particular investigation and stuff like that, that become very formatted. And I can't, I can't stand alone on this. Graham Smith, um, I think he's been on your show as well, hasn't he? Um, yeah, he, yeah. he, he's the same kind of mindset. In fact, he, he created a much more in-depth um, case file um, for paranormal teams and stuff like that. But I wanted to create something that was a bit more easygoing and a lot more 
um, that might be a bit more used across a bigger, wider, wider range in people. The um, only problem with that, though, is people would have to use it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and yeah. people are more concerned, and this is just my opinion, just throwing it out there, but people are more concerned with beepy boxes and flashy lights. Yeah, well, it's it's a different it's a, it's a difference between um, exper- experiencing something, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going out there and doing a ghost hunt over Friday night or your Saturday night, um, socialising with some friends that have the same the same kind of opinions and same kind of approaches and that kind of stuff, and going out there and trying to experience something paranormal. Um, um, but then there's also if you want to if you want to investigate something a little bit more or try and capture some information on it you can do that with your video camera and your audio and all that kind of stuff but if you really really want to get some in-depth information down and do some good investigative work then you need to start documenting stuff unfortunately and that's when so, that's so when what would you class now, but... <laughs> as as good documentation how would that sit for you for me mm-hmm. um i'm probably a little bit more of a pain in the ass because i quite like a lot of information a lot of data and stuff like that and I, even 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 my own investigations haven't been up to my own standards if that makes sense sometimes because I okay can't... so you're saying you, you like a lot of data so what is this data what 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 exactly is it that you're looking for um it's wide ranging i mean you've got you've got to document any experiences that happen so if anyone experiences something you've got to make a note of that um and document that so like a witness statement if you like of what they saw mm-hmm. what happened to them, what they felt etc 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 um you need to um if you're going to be looking at things like during your investigation if you're going to if you're if you've got a case where you're looking at temperature changes and stuff like that then you need to be taking temperature changes uh, sorry temperature measurements throughout the night so your baseline reading as everyone in the ghost hunting community i call it isn't a temperature change isn't a temperature you take at the beginning of the night and then you leave it it's a temperature that you take on a regular occurrence all the way through the night in order to create a baseline throughout your night so then if you do get a, a variance then you understand that variance because obviously as you go through the night in a location in one room and obviously we're in that room as well you have to measure it in the same place too um as you go through the night that temperature will adjust differently. So what to, would you know, measure that with, though? Um, I would measure that with a, a localised like, um, uh, temperature gauge, not 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 one of those um, IR ones because they don't work the same way. So the you gun, think. you wouldn't <laughs> yeah, wouldn't, use a gun? No, I wouldn't use a gun, no. So what would be your reasons for not using the gun? <laughs> well, reasons for not using a gun? Um, they, it's because um, they only... They only measure the tar- so when, it, when you use the the IR, the IR guns when you point them they only measure what they hit so it's like a physical object so if you stand on one side of the room you point at the wall it's going to hit the wall and it's going to measure that spot but depending on how far away you are from that wall and all that kind of stuff it's going to increase the space that it measures as mm-hmm. well it doesn't imagine, it doesn't measure like a spot on the wall it will measure a big patch on the wall because you're too far away. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. So, yeah, you would be checking temperature and you would check it at the beginning and then you would check it at regular intervals. Yeah, and that's the same with electromagnetic field. Um, I, I think on some investigations we've done it with um, magnetic fields um, uh, and things like that as well. We've measured what else? humidity, um, that kind of stuff as well. We've we've measured quite a lot of different stuff all through the night, to be fair. Um, so... Uh, what else have we measured? Um, I've measured in, in some investigations. I've measured lux, which is light. Okay. So, um, and the reason for that is because on a previous investigation at the same at the same location, someone had mentioned um, when when something occurred and an event occurred. One of the things they mentioned was the fact that they 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 felt as if the room got darker, even though the lights mm-hmm. were off. It, yeah, you see, you've heard that so many times. Yeah. So I, so I, I took in, I took in something to measure lux, so I could try and understand if there was an actual, a measurable, light change. There wasn't, but you know, I had a device to try and do it. So, at so least again, you can say that you've looked. And again, so again, I tried because it was mentioned. I tried measuring it, and, and again, you do it in the regular intervals to make sure that's. A, I mean, it wasn't the best, the best way because I mean, the, the one thing that I, I think if you can get your hands on what they call data loggers to do things like this this is this is a much much better way of doing things um because you can just chuck a data logger down in a location and you can leave it and it'll capture information throughout the night yeah so that, 
so that'll give you your baseline reading all the way through the night and um when i've worked with graham we've had we've had a, a system he, he built his team built themselves which is like a data logger that done all that as well so mm-hmm. yeah I spoke to graham previously actually about his his device that he's built that is quite fascinating i would like to see that in action he's built a number over the years now um when I first met when I first met him, we built he built the the data logger, which logs the usual standard EMF stuff and all that kind of bits and pieces. Since um, uh, since reading Thomas Fusco's book, I know he's he's looked into some other theories. So he started measuring um, other things more related to uh, uh, gravity changes and things like that in order to try and understand a particular part of the theory that he's got uh, Fusco's theory. But that's that's the kind of aspect he's taken. That's what we need to be looking at. I think, in my opinion, is he's taken an idea. Um, and a proper probable theory and now he's trying to find a way to prove parts of that theory or mm-hmm. at least look into those, those parts of those theories which do re- which relate back into the paranormal field so it's quite quite interesting to, rather than doing the run-of-the-mill standard standard you know walk around go hunting approach kind of thing which like yeah. i said before there's, there's nothing wrong with that if you enjoy it if you enjoy it go for it but um I, I think we need to capture, start capturing some. Yeah, it's not going to progress the paranormal field in any single way, shape, or form, though, is it? Let's let's be realistic and let's be wanna, honest. If you want to progress things and move things forward, and 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 uh, you know, arouse arouse the, the attention of the um, the academics and things like that, then we need to start putting together a bit more. See, I think I think a lot of people are quite intimidated by the academics because of how things are worded, which is where you come in. <laughs> the, say, the saying quite handy is is the wrong way to put it really but words is your thing not mine so roll <laughs> with it right so that's where you come in quite handy because you'll take something that's quite academic and then you will put your spin on it so that it is more understandable for your average reader <laughs> I don't do it just for the reader I do it for myself sometimes because <laughs> I'm not thoroughly academic or anything like that and and but I, I I push myself to try and understand what's being written, and and by doing that, then I can get gain a better understanding. And it's it's weird as well because um, once I started venturing into reading some of the more academic material and looking at bits and pieces like off the back of the SBR and stuff like that as well, and the Coast Club, um, mm-hmm. it's you begin to see ideas that are already formulated that you've already had yourself or others have already had in the field and stuff like that. You see them and you begin you begin to see that actually that's not that's not anything new. It's something that they thought about years and years and years and years ago and stuff like that. I mean, like I said before, like the, the founders of DSPR, Myers and Sidgwick and uh, uh, Gurney and all those kind of guys, they came up with some fantastic ideas to do with um, the paranormal I and mean, what about apparitions and uh, telepathy and things like that. The, the book I mentioned earlier, Apparitions by Tyrrell, um, he, he's mentioned some fantastic ideas and theories around that as well. And it's, it's, it's all stuff. Tyrrell's not just, the only uh, one that's written a book on telepathy, though, is he? To to about apparitions, uh, Myers coined to the word telepathy. Telepathy, um, and, sorry, yeah, and telepathy, Myers, That's what telepathy, I meant. Telepathy has been used numerous times since then by many different people. Mm-hmm. So, well, you've done one yourself <laughs> on that, haven't you? Yeah, I came up with an idea theory. If you, well, an idea more than a bit of a theory off the back of telepathy, and that was basically um, uh, te- how uh, about telepathic interaction. Um, but it's mm-hmm. more about um it's more about how to document it um using um ideograms than uh than trying to write down the whole script about what's going on so you can and and by using those ideograms you can then refine it down to try and understand how the information flows from one person to the next and pretty much every time i've used it though it refines it down to the most logical path the most logical path is usually a living person whether they're local or non-local to the person receiving the information if you get that <laughs> so, strangely enough i actually do get it when i've read <laughs> i've read your book so you know i i sort of i'm gonna get it right <laughs> sort of well i think when you've read it i think you do tend to understand it a bit more a lot of times when you're saying things it can be quite confusing and quite daunting and and as i say you know because it's it's the the academic side of things people can be quite put off by that but once you overcome it once you overcome that fear, it's actually really interesting. And sometimes it can take just your average Joe, like oh, yeah. yourself or me or Kerry or Paul or any anybody, anyone, just to anyone. come along and say, well, actually, what about if you take that and then add that 
what difference would that come up with? Exactly. I mean, I mean, I, you mentioned about it, seeing the academic has been daunting. I, I, I very much felt that for young, for youngs when I, even when, even when I was in the SPR in a lecture with them people, so I still felt you know daunted by their kind of intellect and their approach to science. I mean, I've sat in SPR lectures where they've had um, slides on the screen about with like different tables of information, all this kind of stuff, and I've just looked at it and gone, um, I don't know what I'm looking at. But then you begin to understand because they do, they do help you understand it with the, with their talk as well. Um, mm-hmm. And different different people in the field as well are much better at relaying that information. Cal Cooper, David Saunders, um, for example, Dean Radin, these kind of people um, are fantastic. At, um, Rupert Sheldrake as well. All these people within the ac- academia are very good at sort of like relaying that information in talks and stuff like that. I mean, um, Sheldrake and Radin have done TED talks. I think. Oh well, at least Sheldrake's done a TED talk. I know that. Um, so that the information's out there for people to look at and start digging into. And the interesting thing is, okay, yeah, it's not all about ghosts and spirits and weird creatures and stuff like that. But then not... neither is the paranormal. No, exactly. The paranormal encompasses all things, UFOs and the lot, basically, anything beyond normal. So it takes the whole lot, and that's what you have to kind of look into. So, I mean, if you if your, if your bag is ghosts and spirits, then fair enough. But then in that there's umpteen different other ideas that come of come out into academia that mm-hmm. know about bits and pieces to do that and there's research and that that's been done over 100 years ago capturing those kind of experiences and stuff like that and we're, we're at a point now where we've got all these gadgets laid out in front of us that we can utilize to try and get some information in order to get this information together to, to do things like i mean i'm not just okay. talking about things. Oh, i'm sorry <laughs> let's so, let's go back to this this gadgets that that you you've just brought up we've got all these gadgets these days that we can we can utilize how do we 100 percent know that what these gadgets are measuring is what we should be looking for that's that's kind of half the problem half the problem is the fact that a lot of the gadgets are um repackaged measurement tools with a ghost ghost title on the front of it um I mean, most ghost hunters will swear by their spirit boxes and stuff like that, for example. Chuck them out. Academia doesn't want to know about it. It doesn't care about Well, actually, yeah, I to- <laughs> totally agree there. And I'm hoping to actually get somebody on the show um, coming up who specialises in EVP. So that's going to be really interesting because I know exactly what you're referring to there because that was something that that was at one of the SPR lectures that we both attended. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, and because it, it's, it's basically because because it's scanned through FM, F, FM, AM bands and stuff like that, and chucks in by, by uh, lots of background noises, and that makes it very difficult to be taken seriously as evidential information. Mm-hmm. And then you've got a lot of a lot of things that throw into EVPs. I'm, I'm no expert in EVPs. The person you're talking about is more of an expert, <laughs> clearly. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> she she obviously so, is an expert. So, yeah, so, so that's she, that's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and it's it's elements like that that need to be looked into a bit, a bit hard. I mean, some of the gadgets as well. well like how many people are going to dismiss anything that you've got to say if you if you don't agree that it works one hundred percent? How many people are going to disagree? Sorry, I've, I've done something. <laughs> I missed that. So I know I didn't I didn't word that very well. Sorry, I was <laughs> thinking about four questions later on down the line. Um, a lot of people, when you say to them, okay, so so this expert has said that this is completely irrelevant your evps aren't actually evps right how many people are going to completely argue that case because yes it is an evp well then this this is this is this is the concept of um peer review basically um so in 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 that kind of situation if you say you've got a piece of evidential evp that you want to call you know a class a evp mm-hmm. and you, you you need to be able to back that piece of evp up with um good background information and stuff like that so you can prove that it's under certain circumstances it was taken these things happened you know so you've got the background story all that kind of stuff and you can present it and go here we go this is this is the this is the evp so now but as soon as you present that that could get argued by our We'll call them our ex, our EVP experts in academia, um, uh-huh. because they could they could tear it apart and go, well, actually, I've listened to your EVP and I can tell that you've done, uh, you've basically you've you've cleaned it up so so much that you've actually made it 
un, unusable because it's now been you've, you've almost formulated it to a point that's done this or or you've um you've cut it in a certain place so you've not been able to produce the entire piece of information for me to look at so i can make my own assumption up you entitled your <laughs> evp document or file name <laughs> with exactly what what you thought i was looking for so you've already influenced me in telling me what you think it should be just like you know evp one and then they can to us aside, you know, it's, if they've mm-hmm. presented it by, if, however, if the ghost hunter has gone, here's a piece of information. I presented this audio file as audio file one to ten different people. Actually, you know, probably more than that. Probably about like twenty odd. Um, and of the twenty people, <coughs> um, uh, say of the twenty people, fifteen people thought it was exactly the same thing. So that's a greater than you, you're then creating a statistical analysis of the EVP to prove its worth without actually influence them in any way obviously all this kind of has to be recorded properly so an evp on its own an audio file on its own is never going to be evidence you have to be able to prove that evp beyond its position in order to say that that is then evidence and that's that's how it works but that could be equally argued the other way so you could do all that put it into the academia they could turn around and go actually no because i can see from this 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 and this 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 that you've fallen over sorry (laughs) and then you're back to the square one again but that's that's the process of science that's what you have to do. You have to kind of, you have to present a really good argument with lots of background information and, you know, uh, experiments and stuff like that, hypothesis, in order to get to those kind of points. And it's hard work. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. And for some that aren't interested in doing something like that, it might be boring and it as well. So they might not be in it for that kind of stuff. They might be in it for what they find interesting and exciting and, you know, keeps them doing something in their hobby these for a lot of people it's it's a hobby and it will remain a hobby and i think um actually one of the one of the great one of the great known skeptics either it was either wiseman or french called um called a lot of the ghost hunters um something like ske- um uh hobbyists or something like that as well mm-hmm. and so they that so they could never be taken seriously sort of thing basically yeah but the only well, way I've, you're going to be taken seriously is to follow, follow, follow the correct mm-hmm. path isn't it yeah yeah and it's not always easy to follow the correct path I, I mean you must know yourself when you when you're doing your research for your blogs sometimes that can take you down a whole other rabbit hole that you had no intention of going down oh yeah yeah i mean i I've, i used to go on i just used to go out go out go something and just you know capture audio files and videos and photographs and stuff like that and thought that was enough so I've, how did it progress for you um it got to a point where it wasn't enough <laughs> i i captured <laughs> helpful it, it was. I'd, I'd gone through several investigations, doing it the age-old ghost hunting way. I had a video of an object moving by, its, by itself. Okay, granted, it was about it was probably about half a foot, but it was it was moving by itself, and I knew that we had tested it to the extremities where we knew that none of us moved it. It couldn't have been moved by us, so we tested that. We had um, I had a crystal clear EVP, as in like a class A crystal clear. You know, you could actually hear the voice, and the people in the group that were in the group knew. All of us knew it was not us. We were like pretty much 100% sure that this was not us talking. It was somebody else. I had an EVP. I had an object moving. I had um, I done a Singapore experiment and lots of sh- lots of stuff kicked off and all that kind of stuff. So I knew that certain things happened at certain times and all this kind of stuff. So I had all this all this ghost hunting evidence, if you want to call it that, uh-huh. all built up. Um, but it, I soon I soon realised that outside of the group of people that were there, it wasn't enough. So it had to be. It had. There had to be more, and that's that's when I started stumbled in on the likes of the SPR more, and getting involved with them and seeing. Started reading their journal and realizing that the um, research of places like Coastal, Northampton University, uh, the SPR in the early days, um, and academics and, and stuff like that, the the world over as well. Uh, you've got the Irons in, the Irons Institute as well over in over in American uh, America land, and you, they do a huge amount of research and produce. Um, papers and stuff that go into journals and stuff like that not just not just the spr journal either you've got paris uh, you've got parapsychological association that's got journals you've got psychology journals you've got other science and physics journals that have had stuff in them from fluid paranormal stuff as well all because these people have put the work in done the, done the research and then delivered it as a paper or a book um to, to prove the fact and these and i've started reading those as well like raiden sheldrake uh, Cooper, um, Myers, um, Tyrrell, and numerous numerous others that are on my bookshelf behind me. Um, Playfair, 
he's worth a mention as well because he's not necessarily an academic but he knows what he's talking about because he's done the same he learned he's learned his way through it uh, yeah yeah and um, play fair you know he he was he was a mockery at one point and then 50 years later boom yeah no he exactly i mean he's um i think he studied languages or something didn't he at cambridge or something rightly so he wasn't yeah. necessarily into that those kind of aspects and then ended up in brazil and then stumbled across um healing of all things uh spiritual healing and that's kind of where his journey started <laughs> yeah you see this is it though i mean the journey most people's journeys start off with one thing happening and then it leads to um curiosity with want of a better word yes that's exactly right curiosity curiosity is a big thing going back to the spr i mean you've mentioned that a few times now um and not a lot of Dare I say, younger people, I'm not that I don't, I don't think for two minutes anybody from the SPR will be listening to this, but <laughs> a lot of them are of the older generation now. There's not that many people that are younger. Um, I, th- I, th- I, th- I think, to be honest, <laughs> from my own point of view as well, I think as you, as you move on in the paranormal, um, a couple of things happen and you get to a certain age and a certain understanding you and i think it's a natural progression because it happens with people that aren't just interested in the paranormal either it happens with other people as well and um you get an interest where you start you start being more interested in factual things and you start watching more documentaries or you're more all of, all of, all of a sudden you start you know you're not you're less interested in fiction and you're more interested in real things tangible things and, and if you're interested in paranormal that then progresses your your position into looking into things in a bit more in depth like i did to be fair and then, then you then that's when sort of organisations like the SPR come into their own, um, and that's when if you join places like that, then then you start getting their journals and you're reading that and the magazine and the stuff they've got online well, as well. The SPR and the Ghost Club, you don't yeah. have to be invited no. to those organisations, <laughs> do you? You can just join. No, no, it's been like that for years as well, many many years. You can just go along to their websites, um, either the Ghost Club or the SPR. And, and click on the old members bit and then away you go. Um, put your membership in and then hopefully hopefully all will be well and you can enjoy. And there's, the benefits are amazing as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to plug the SPR, but... Now, are you sure? Are you sure oh, it's I, not just because no, no, you write for the Paranormal <laughs> Review that you're plugging the SPR, Mr Nib? Yeah, I might plug them a little bit because I write for their magazine. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you get a journal four times a year with a magazine, a really good one, Paranormal Review, that I write for. Um, did I mention that? Um, and, <laughs> no, you didn't. Did and, you want to run that by me again? No, no, it's fine. Um, but okay. also, off, 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 that, off that membership fee that you pay for on a yearly basis, which, to be fair, isn't that bad either. It's about the price of um, one night in a haunted location. Um, to be fair um, and for that as well you also get access to their to their library as well which you can either visit in central London or you can contact them and you can borrow books from there because it is a lending library um, and that way and, and that way you can um, you can sort of like brough off so you don't have to buy books all the time you can actually borrow them from there sort of thing I mean there are a lot of different books that you can't take from there because obviously they're things like um, people's PhDs and stuff like that and I think that's that's the other thing I think is worth worth shouting out is that i think it's one of their members actually mentioned the other day that there's now over a hundred phds based on parapsychology alone uh-huh. which is pretty crazy pretty, pretty mental ways, <laughs> i think and just, just to say that there's nothing else going on in the field would be absolutely ridiculous then nothing mm-hmm. so yeah exactly yeah, so how <laughs> did writing for the spr come about because that 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 opportunity doesn't come around every day, I'm sure. How did that come about? Um, I obviously I was a member. Um, I attended a study day at the SPR. I'd already been to about two, two, two lectures, I think, two or three lectures. Um, and I went to one of their study days. I can't. Um, and I blogged about it on my website um, and wrote it all up and all that kind of stuff. Done about. You know, quite quite good in in depth, in detailed uh, blog still on there actually on my website, um, and they literally contacted me from that, sent me an email and sort of said we saw your blog um, on our study day and wondered if you'd be interested in um, writing for our our magazine Paranormal Review. Just and basically my, my role is I report on the lectures and the and the study days, and it goes in the okay. magazine. Okay, yeah. okay, so so you attend the study days or lectures or. Yep. And then and then write about what what's been happening. Yep. Yeah. So about what the, what the lecture's about, the, the turnout, that kind of thing, and 
my take on it as well, which I think is really good because it means that they're getting a point of view of someone who's not academic, so to speak, as I call it. So mm-hmm. um, I'm not a doctor or a professor or anything like that, but um, I give them that viewpoint of someone who's sat in there and learns on And to be fair, I can't tell you that there's been there's been no lecture and no study day that I've walked away that I've not learned anything and not come away with more questions. So they're, they're well worth the well worth the visit. Again, that's another can plug in them, but <laughs> just for the right room, but <laughs> now it's it's true. You do you learn a lot. And again you learn about I mean, one of the things I learned was um they've done a study day on uh, lucid dreaming, for example. I'd uh-huh. never once not even once looked into it, didn't even know much about lucid dreaming. I knew the term, I'd heard a little bit about it, didn't really dive into it, didn't think it was anything for me. And then from that from those lectures though and that study day i realized that there's crossovers into other things like telepathy and things like that and and possibility of it being linked into those those kind of elements um i met one of the guys um who, who that was also um a guy that was heavily involved with the gansfield experiment and stuff like that as well so you begin to begin to link things up a bit and all of a sudden it becomes a bit more kind of like for me it becomes a lot more interesting and exciting yeah. well again you've just mentioned um experiments that Oh, yes. <laughs> that are quite, shall we say, quite old. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, a lot of people are referring to them as if they was invented last week. <laughs> yeah, the, Gans- the Gansfield experiment's been done done to death over mm-hmm. the years, to be fair. It's, um, if I, I'm pretty sure I read something somewhere that it's been done so many times and proved, proved itself so many times. It's actually... Um, it's it was it's it's proven itself more so than what they had to prove in order to get you know simplistic cures in for medication and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Gone, gone beyond gone beyond that, and obviously with with Gansfield as well, that's studying the, the concept of telepathy and stuff like that, and communication and elements of that, and that's that's quite that's quite key, I think, to a lot of what happens um, in the field as well, which is quite interesting, and, it, and that sort of proves to me a point is like if you can transfer information from one person to another. Um, under sensory deprivation um, then that information could be any kind of information which could then be your ghosts basically well yeah exactly so. so what have you got coming up then Mr Nib so you are planning on writing a book yeah you stopped so, me earlier yeah um, sorry yeah, I still... know that's why I went back to it because we, <laughs> we ended up going off on a bit of a tangent sorry um well, um, I, as as most people know, I started off I started off the year working with Sarah Chimacero on a basically a weekly blog where we bounced from one website to the other doing supernatural synchronicity, which was um, I'd write one, she'd then answer mine, write her own, and then that was a falls all the time. Um, but what we decided to do is we decided to continue that somewhat and um, hopefully turn it into a book. So basically, all the posts that you've already seen will be in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're also working in the background now offline um, to produce some additional content for you as well. So um, our own ideas, that kind of stuff. So it'll be more more, more of the same kind of stuff again. So more of the same, right, but you've just said your own ideas. So your own ideas on, on uh, what? Theories around the paranormal, maybe, things like that, perhaps. Different different stuff. <laughs> <laughs> No spoilers here tonight. More supernaturally synchronous. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, don't want to. Not blame Gail for trying, eh? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to restrict what I've got to write about by saying, "Oh yeah, it's going to have this in it," and then go, "Oh no, now I've got to write that." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose. I suppose. So, with your blogging, mm-hmm. you started off the year, as you said, with the supernatural synchronicity. Um, you've done a few a few blogs since then yeah i've kind of slowed down with the blogging at the moment because i've got a lot of other stuff to catch up on um a lot of the lecture work i've been doing writing that up and catching up on that um obviously writing <laughs> writing writing a book and other bits and pieces and projects and stuff i've got going on in the background as well that, um i'm kind of working on some little research things that i'm doing as well so i can't oh. talk about <laughs> well you can't you can't really say that and then not expect me to ask questions about it so you okay, can't you can go into me. detail. <laughs> no. Okay, so you can't go into detail, but um, a brief summary, maybe. I'm, I'm just working on some um, personal and some research into paranormal kind of areas, sort of thing. I can't really divulge much because there's others, others involved. So, okay. but, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Again, I... you can't blame Miguel for trying, though, eh? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if you don't ask. That's true. That's true. So is there any areas that you're currently working on for your own benefit? Um, I'm probably going to look a bit more into the telepathy area again. Um, because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've just, I just finished a book called Apparitions by Tyrrell and he touches back again on a lot of telepathy stuff that I'd read about by Myers and all that kind of stuff. And again, it's kind of like pushed it up to the forefront. Um, I, I even opened up my, my own little booklet the other day again, read through some of the bits of pieces I read on, I wrote on it as well, because I think telepathy is a, a really interesting idea i mean a lot of the people when you ask them about telepathy these days they'll say oh it's when one person communicates with another person Mm -hmm. mind to mind but it's a bit bigger than that it's a bit more um interesting i mean they talk about in this book uh, they talk about hallucinations as well and illusions as well and again these are two words where people associate those with being a hallucination is something that you you know you're is like medically induced or something or you you know is, you know, a drug creates it creates a hallucination or a, st- a state of not being well creates not a hallucination. necessarily no no yeah, no yeah yeah it, and then you've got illusions it goes as well. on yeah but but back then they they were associating these with basically the the concepts of seeing seeing things as well now one of the things that Tyrrell does brilliantly and and i think is um worth shouting out about is he mentions the fact that it's weird because I, I read his book um and i think i've mentioned it before at some point as well um that the ghost he 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 makes it he, he talks, talks about a thing called a producer and stage carpenter um and and the concept is basically that um the ghost is a construct so although you see it in the physical in, in the in your environment that you're physically stood in the ghost isn't necessarily in that environment physically it's more in your mind and you're you're receiving the information and then adding the information into your own picture and that's where you get all the other stuff come from so it's a construct that's kind of happening at the same time and that can happen for different kinds of hallucinations if you want to call them that mm-hmm. because you can see because sometimes it's not ghosts you see you can see a whole you can see like um you know uh you might look out of a window and where there's houses on a normal day, you look out this window on this day and you see an orchard because that's how it was 200 years ago, that kind yeah. of thing. So that's a massive hallucination, that kind of, so, and that's, and basically what he said is that's information that's being picked up from one person to the other or derived from somewhere. And then you're constructing it in your mind as part of your reality, if you like. And that to me around ghosts and things like that makes a hell of a lot more sense than, some dude that's been hanging around for loads of years. You know, in some dude form. that's just been hanging around. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, <laughs> he had nothing better to do, so he thought, "I know, it, I'm exactly. going to stay here." And, and and as much as as much as I'd like it, I'd like to move be, there. As as much as I'd like there to be, you know, ghosts and stuff like that, and afterlife. I don't think um, there's enough evidence to support that side of things. So. I'm. I have to kind of just go with a uh, go with the concept of of where the information might come from, and that seems to always seem to be coming from the the living rather than rather than still the dead. I think we might have lost Gemma Carey if you're listening. <laughs> oh. Right, it looks like we've, yes, little technical <laughs> looks like we've lost Gemma at this particular present mind. So you were saying about constructs of a ghost. Yes, I was, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because I just, like I said, I just read, just read Tyrrell about, and he's book about apparitions, and he was basically putting together this concept of a producer and stage hand, uh, stage carpenter, that where you get the information come in, and then it kind of, like, you construct the presence of a ghost mm. in your mind's eye. Rather, rather than it being uh, a ghost that's you know walking through the room with you, it's something that's actually in your mind's eye, which to me makes a lot more sense than than um, an afterlife kind of thing. So it's almost like a projected is, hallucination, almost. Yeah, you, yeah, it's like um, you're taking in the information from your senses, so your sense mm-hmm. data from your eyes and your nose and all that kind of stuff that tells you about the room that you're in. But then they're adding into this um, into this setup. Uh, the, the figure of a ghost, for example. So the ghost, you don't actually see the ghost with your eyes. It's just it added to the data, the sense data that comes with your eyes that so goes then into your mind and then is all constructed in your mind kind of thing. Because obviously what we pick up around us is all constructed in our minds rather than just what we see. Because that's just, you know, photons and stuff that are coming in light and form and that kind of stuff. And it's all put together in our head. 
And then, <clears throat> and then the ghost is just added into that sort of as an added added extra thanks to the these producer and stage carpenter elements, which is <laughs> interesting. It's absolutely fascinating when you look at it in those terms because we talk in terms of like it coming from ourselves and not from or information is there, but it's how that's being accessed. Yes, yeah. So yes, it's it. I mean, he he talks about it being um, for crisis apparition is a great one. So so it's on. If someone decides to, well, not decides to, if someone has the unfortunate position of them uh, dying, one of their last wishes might be to communicate with a, a loved one, for example. And by doing that, they will transfer that information um, telepathically to the other person. And then that's when the other person has what they call a crisis apparition. Um, and then they'll, they'll see a ghost of the person that's dying because um, that information has been telepathically sent to them. And they might see that ghost in the room that they're stood in. Um, or they may see that person in a scene, for example, as well. So they could, it might, you can get a whole, you know, additional information as well, if you like, transferred in this form. And all this is, <laughs> all this is put together in in the book. But it's also referenced to cases in Phanta- um, Phantoms as a Living that the uh, the SPR put together, so you, which has got thousands of cases as well. So it's not just like them going, oh, we've got this one idea due to this story that I heard. It's like they've looked at thousands of cases. And gone. Ah, this information gets put together, and this could be this, and this could be that, and it, and it's also referencing people like Gurney and Myers and all that kind of stuff, and their positions on it as well as it goes as it goes through. And it's um it's interesting because before I read the book, I I, I think I said I can't remember if I said to you or someone I said to someone it's, it's like an acetate from a, an overhead projector. So the information is the acetate, and you put that on the other jet, and it kind of projects it over over what you already got, so it's like an overlay. And then when I read that, it's like that's exactly what I meant, <laughs> sort of thing. So it's really it's really cool. <laughs> so why do you not think that more of the paranormal field are thinking in these kind of terms and looking at this kind of work? Because it it's beyond hashtag it's a ghost. Do you know what I mean? It's beyond that. So why can we not? Why does the majority of the field... I know you talked earlier on about hobbyists not wanting to progress themselves, but if you've got this interest and you're out there doing that, why are people not... more people not reaching out for that? Um, in your opinion, of course. In my, in my opinion, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, bit of, there's a mix. There's, um, not everyone knows where to go and get the information. Um, I didn't when I first started. I didn't even know that SPI existed until I delved deeper and delved deeper and then found it. Um, some people are quite happy with the sensationalism approach, if that's if that's okay, <laughs> the very good way of putting it, I suppose. It's like um, like back in the Victorian times, you had like spiritualism and all that kind of stuff, and that, some of that was quite sensationalism, it was quite a drama and all that kind of stuff, and you had a lot of things around that element of it. And I think now with TV and stuff like that, TV has become our... Victorian sort of um, sensationalist, spiritualist kind of drive where people are driven through that same, same kind of element of it. I don't think it's a bad thing because I think it drives people into the field because people mm. go, oh, I've watched that TV programme and they get an interest and it goes from there. I mean, I, pretty, I, I could imagine that both people, both people on this call put their hand up and go, yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. Um, but I think that there needs to be more out there media-wise, social media, TV, YouTube, that c- encompasses... Not just the reality TV approach, but also more of the documentary and kind of approach and that kind of stuff. I mean, for most people, it might not be very exciting. It won't be hashtag demon and all that kind of stuff. But it will certainly have um, some people will pick it up and go, actually, I quite like this because it's a documentary, a documentary kind of approach. It's got facts in there. It's documented the case and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think people realise that it's like that. I think people are beginning to get shuttered into this Friday night, Saturday night ghost hunt, Friday night, Saturday night ghost hunt, and not realising, and research researches, online research about a brief part of the history of the location, and there's less and less people doing a lot, a lot of research into the, into it, and good good background research. When I say brief online history, I mean Wikipedia and the site that they're going to, opposed to other locations like British Library and other really good resources that are out there like the SPR online and all that kind of stuff um cyber encyclopedia things like that so i think there's a lack of lack of research but then i think that's down to timing i don't think people want to put that much time into it it's mm. a hobby for some people so they don't want to, they don't want to spend that time they want to go out friday night see the friends that they do it with all the time because it's their friends have a bit of a laugh and and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but the problem is for the people that are serious about it it muddies the water 
Mm. It makes it difficult to it makes it difficult for some people because even those hobbyists will go, oh, "I'm a serious investigator," and it's like, "Well, okay, fine," but then you're not investigating; you're ghost hunting. And I've, I'll put my hand up that I've been on many a ghost hunt and done ghost hunting and not bothered to capture any information like that because it was just a night for, for enjoying myself. And then there's a lot of times where I've been overly conscious about gathering stuff and written it down in spreadsheets and all kinds of lovely, lovely stuff. <laughs> Right, now we've spoken about bridging the gap between the academic, the SPR type clubs and the ghost hunting community before now, um, many times privately. And do you think that's achievable? Um, I don't think it's achievable in a form of all of a sudden everybody will get up and get along and work together, unfortunately. Um, there's, according to something that someone said in one of their lectures recently, they said there's like over 900 odd ghost, ghost hunting clubs out there in the UK alone. I don't think all of them are suddenly going to turn around and go, actually, we need to be doing it this way and work with the academics and, and get this done. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I'd like to see, see a methodology of getting more people aware of more information so we could get more people coming into things like the SPR, more people getting involved with serious research and stuff like that. Um, rather than just kind of like doing the ghost hunting element of it. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are out there that want to do that but don't know how to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where that's where they need to kind of... But the problem is there's no there's no link to those people, if you like. People aren't looking for them. Um, I think I said to someone recently in the SPR, I said, um, there's no talent scouting. Yep. You're not looking for anyone. And so you're you're waiting for them to find you sort of thing. But then that's also kind of how academia works in a way, isn't it? Because it's like, well... If they're smart enough and they know what they're looking for, they'll find us because we're right here. We haven't moved. So, <laughs> I th- in my opinion on this is that there needs to be a bridging of the gap from both sides. I think the academics need to get oh, off there. Yeah. No disrespect to, to the academics, your well achievements and that, but get off your high horse a little bit and start interacting with the ghost hunting community that's out there because then they might start getting the information they need if they start talking to the guy and saying, this is what we need. Can you do this? Can, will you work with us to do this? And the ghost hunting community going, yeah, actually, we'll do that well, for uh, you. And then that would build that database uh, because these are the people that are going out there. Like you said, every Friday night, every Saturday night, locations are being investigated time and time again by different teams, the same location. You could build up a fantastic database working with the right teams in the right places of data and information that is sorely needed it's also been well recognized that the spr the cases coming to the spr has dropped yes that's true yeah they yeah. tend to be going or people tend to be approaching not being ghost funny the ghost hunting community yeah. so surely that then you know there needs to be a give and take from both sides i oh, agreed 100 percent. i mean i think um uh and and wins from uh uh, Steve Parsons as well recently they've they've been they mentioned something along the lines of um parapsychologists for example need to get out of the labs every now and then and go in, go out into the field and do some investigating with ghost hunters and stuff like that in order to understand how we do things but they at the same time they could then suggest to them what they think they should be doing and then they could like mold the two together so they can understand how a field investigation and a lab investigation could work together and or, or even look at the same thing from both 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 angles sort of thing and that's that's what really it really is needed to happen. You're, you're absolutely right. Academics need to bridge the gap one way, but I think also the ghost hunters need to kind of go right. Okay, they're not stuck yet, stuck up in their thing, and they need to get involved, get involved with them a little bit as well. So it needs to be kind of a it's a two way thing, a <laughs> two way street. Yeah, bridging of the gap a little bit to get them both involved. But it's it's um it's a long way. It's got a long way to go, unfortunately. But it, but there are people like like I just mentioned, and and um, Steve Parsons, para science. Or something I think. they've they've started doing a lot of stuff like that they've um they're they're quite good at doing that they know what they're doing they've got people involved that will measure things properly and all that kind of stuff as well um go into detail capture the right information and evidence and that kind of stuff and they're not um sensation from what i've from what i've spoken to them about some of the cases and bits and pieces not sensationalists in that factor either um so they're they're looking at it quite quite seriously. I mean, obviously Steve helped wrote the new guidance book for for the SPR as well, so he's well linked in there, um, and knows a lot about uh, EVP, which we mentioned earlier. Um, and she's just done a lecture at the SPR as well. Both of them lectured recently as well there. Um, so those kind of people need to, I think, are, are trying to reach out now to the ghost hunting community. Um, but the problem I foresee <laughs> from the ghost hunting side <laughs> is there seems to be a gravitation away from 
academia and presenting information into 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 reputable journals and or places where people can talk about things properly like a, like a good and it, they're going towards the media side of things as in like tv and youtube now this isn't necessarily a bad thing it's just it's not being managed the way it could be managed in order to get good information out of it i don't think mm-hmm. which is a shame so it is a shame now Unfortunately, we've lost Gemma along the way, so that's why I took over. I do apologise for that, everybody. I know um, it was getting, and I came in and didn't really listen to what was being said, so I do apologise <laughs> if Ashley repeated yourself. Um, I'd just like to refer to the chat room before you go um, tonight, Ashley. Um, you've oh. got quite a few people in there. You've got Wes saying he likes the way you think and appreciates your efforts and your methods. Cheers, Wes. <laughs> um, and we need more scientific minds like yours in the field. Thank you. <laughs> Ness has asked, what are your thoughts on sleep paralysis? It's a thing. <laughs> I've not really looked that deeply into sleep paralysis. paralysis. I can't say it for starters, for I say. Um, but um, it's, it, is, it is interesting. I think it does explain a few things that people often will attribute to being other ghostly going on sort of thing. But um, I don't know a lot. I don't know enough about it to really comment in detail about it, unfortunately, at this point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave Harazny is in the uh, chat room too and he asked what do you think about the stone tape theory <laughs> have we got another hour <laughs> yeah that's a whole different topic to be fair but um in, in brief in brief it was a good tv show in the 70s wasn't it <laughs> that does me I'm working completely opposite spectrum with you on this one um I know what people think of as, as the stone tape theory being what it is, and yeah, okay, fine. Um, uh, no, I don't. I don't buy into it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to put it out there. I don't buy into it. I could be wrong, I, you know, but you know, prove it. Um, I don't, <laughs> no, You're going to need your data, I, data, Dave. <laughs> yeah, you'd need you'd need data through. I mean, you'd need a lot of data to prove it. And to be quite frank, um, I think I talked to a physicist at one point about that kind of understanding of things and. Okay, yes, a lot of people will attribute it to being emotional energy that's bound into things, and yes, we might be on different levels on that, Gary, but um, it would take a hell of a lot of energy to imprint information of some kind that could then be reaccessed at some point into local areas. So I'm, not, I'm not a big buyer into that. So although there could be elements within the local area that might be able to store information, getting it in there in the first place from an event, per se, I don't think would happen. In my in my understanding at this point, and I could be wrong, and in which case, prove me, prove it to me. That's what I say because I'd like to know. Okay, there so. you go, Dave. That's that's Ashley's opinion <laughs> on that one. Uh, okay, so Ashley, we've got three minutes left of the show. You've referenced a few projects you're working on right now. Um, so, what is next? I mean, I know we, you're working on longer term projects, but what can we see in more of the immediate future? Um, from now, um, probably a few blogs <laughs> now and then. Not, not regular, not regular. No, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, well, I mean, not so many, not so much regular blogs now. Like I was doing when I was doing supernatural synchronicity, but that's because I'm working on quite a few things in the background, like like the book with Sarah and stuff like that. Anyway, um, I've got a lot of writing of articles and that for the SPR to catch up on and stuff like that. And I've got a few other, like I said to Gemma, little projects going on, little research projects that I can't really talk about at the moment because. So basically, you might be a little bit quieter than we normally would expect from you, yeah. but that doesn't mean to say nothing is going on. It's just bigger stuff. It's long, longer term stuff, yeah, that takes a lot more brain power that I have to concentrate more. So I, can't. I try and knock out a blog every now and then, though, because I, it, I, I find them quite relaxing to do an odd one, like the microwave one or a funny one like that sort of thing, because that's quite, quite fun to write. Uh, maybe one on the stone tape theory today. <laughs> now you leave that stone tape theory alone, Mr. Nib, is all I'm saying. On that note, thank you so much for coming on to Gemma's show. Again, we apologise that Gemma dropped. Um, she's, bless her, she's, try- she's messaging me saying, I'm trying, I'm really trying to get back on. But she's been unable to do so. But thank you so much for joining her and me tonight That's all right. That's uh, <laughs> if you miss any of our shows do not forget go over to our youtube channel click like share and subscribe and you will get notified of any of the new shows go up whilst we're at it have you heard ashley about the trending ness in a dress 
Ness in a dress. <laughs> Ness in a dress. Ness in a dress. We are trying to raise two hundred and fifty pounds for lipo dystrophy. All and, and basically, if we raise that money, Ness will investigate in a dress. Go over to the Paranormal Charity Warriors page to find out all the information on that, or the Parasearch Radio group page, and you'll find the post there too. On that note, we'd like to bid you all a very farewell and thank you for joining us. Good night, Ashley. Good night. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.